So anyhow, I'm teaching the message tonight, and the message is that we all have a story. We all have a personal story that God has given us. I've heard countless people just try to take a random verse out of the scripture and say, this is your whole life. This is God's will for you. Countless people. But it's not true. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, andy has been studying Ephesians. And in Ephesians 2.10 it says, We are God's workmanship, created in Christ for good works, which God predestined for us to walk in. And people often wonder, you know, what does that mean, we're God's workmanship? What is it? We're God's workmanship. What does this mean? Well, it means God has made us for good works. It means he has a purpose for our life. Every single one of us. And we've heard this. This is an old phrase. We have a purpose for your life. There's a purpose for your life. And, you know, there's evangelists that say, God's will for your life is to go out and win souls. You know, other people say, go out and vote for Republican or Democrat. You know, everybody has something that this is God's purpose for your life. You know, and some will, I've heard a lot of people take the verse um, in Mark. It says, in my name, they shall cast out demons, they shall heal the sick, they shall prophesy. And they say, this is God's will. You want to know God's will? Do this. Take this one verse and make it your whole life. Well, that's not your whole life. And I'm going to show you today why it's not and what your life is really about. Well, I want to start out today with David. David says, In the book of the scroll, it was written in me to do thy will, O God. This is in Psalm 40. This is talking about David. It also talks about Christ. But David also says in Psalm 139, and I've got a lot of scriptures, so you guys probably not one going to try to keep up with me. In Psalm 139, he says, You know all the days of my life. They've been written out in your book. And see, there's a lot of people in Scripture, they have their own story. You got David, you know, David becoming the king, David and Goliath. You have Daniel, you have Gideon. You have Christ himself, Moses. And these are people that, it's almost like they're born into a greater realm. And why is that? It's because they realize the story that God's put on their, on their life. You know, we are born from above. You know, all of us are really born from above. But there's certain people that really step into this call. And even Moses back then, it was like he was born into a whole different world. You know, sure, he was, he was birthed by the Hebrews and, and grew up in the courts of Pharaoh. But he had a special call and to the world, he was just an old, angry man. You know, 80 years old, killed a couple people, beat some people up. Angry old man, you know, beat, hitting rocks with his staff. You know, but to God, he said, Moses, you, you're the most humble man on the earth, but I'm going to let you know me face to face. And God raised him up to go into the promise to, to take the children out of Egypt. And his call was to go into the promised land. Didn't make it quite there, but... You know, David, in this world, he's born as a shepherd boy. See, all these people are born as nobodies. Jesus Christ. People said, you know, is this not Mary and Joseph's son? He used to play with our children. You know, Gideon was a nobody. You know, they said, you know, who took down this altar? Gideon, that little punk, that nobody? You know, who, who is this guy? You now, John the Apostle was an old slave. He was working out in the mines. And, you know, people thought he was a nobody, just an old man. <coughs> now, Queen Esther was just a beautiful shell. People said, wow, what a beautiful woman. Well, this beautiful woman changed the world because, you know, she risked her life for her people. Now, Joseph, he was a dreamer. People saw him as a slave and, and eventually as a prisoner. He was thrown in there as, as a sex offender. You know, people said that he was trying to... Take advantage of Potiphar's wife. Well, she was trying to take advantage of him. But it didn't work out for either of them. And, you know, this happens all through Scripture. We have these people. They have a whole higher call. They're born, like, into a whole different order. And yet the world doesn't recognize them, so they try to fit into the world. You know, this happened in my own life. But look at someone like, look at someone like Gideon. You know, the people say a sword for the Lord, but also a sword for Gideon. And you see, God births you into a heavenly calling. He births you. He gives you a special gift, and he births you into a heavenly calling. But if you have that call on you, 
that temptation is, well, how, how do I fit into the world around me? How do I fit into everything that I see? But see, what we don't realize is if we take hold of that calling that he's birthing us into, we're also going to have his anointing to walk through that calling. You know, it says in Timothy, did each of us are born with a special gift? I can remember myself when I was born, I used to look at the world around me and think, man, how fake everybody is. You know, everyone, all these Christians I know, their lives are so boring. You know, people talk about Christ, but, but what's the point of anything? There, there's no point to life. You know, life could be so much different. Life could be wonderful. We could have an incredible life. You know, if people loved each other, if people really embraced each other, if, if we all worked together, you know, we're sons of God. We're sons of the most high living God. This is incredible. Wow. You know, and I went to a school and I thought, wow, this will be great. You know, I've got other Christians around me. This will be an incredible thing. We're all sons of God together. We can, we can really have a good time. We can see God. Well, I sure did meet the devil there. <laughs> Met Mr. Old Hypocrite. And there was a lot of good people there, but you know what I realized is most Christians, they really have no idea what their life is about. You know, the, the fruit of the flesh, the fruit of the flesh is division and faction. We have 6,000 different denominations of the body of Christ. And I, bet, I tell you, go into any one of these churches today, and they're going to throw something in your face, and they're going to say, this is God's will for you. You know, they'll pick out one scripture. You know, it says, you know, here's God's will. Bam, here's God's will. Honor your mother and your father. You shall have long life. Here's God's will for you. Go to all the nations. Here's God's will for you. Raise the dead. And, and people will take one scripture and make it everything. You know, you got to be baptized, you know, this way. You have to have your, your shoes on and your shoelaces tied when you get in the water, you know, so you know you're tied to Christ. You know, you have to bake the pie with the cherries on top instead of inside, because if it's inside, it's like the flesh is covering it up. I mean, it's so silly. There are so many different theories people have. You know, you can't wear this at church. You can't have this kind of music. You have to play guitar. You can't play guitar. You have to wear your pants down to here. And this has nothing to do with what God's call is in our life. You have some churches that focus on community, some that focus on teaching, some that focus on evangelism. But, you know, what we try to focus on here is, hey, who are you in the Spirit? Who has God called you to be? What, what, is, what is the fruit of your life? And we're called the body of Christ, and why are we called the body of Christ? Because we're each members of His body. Each of us represent a part of His body. And see, I was so mad as a kid. Is, is this too loud? Is that, okay, good. I was, I was so mad because I was a kid, and I like to have a fun time. I like to have my friends over and go hike through the forest, you know, maybe play some video games, play football in the yard. That was fun for me. I enjoyed that. And I like to talk about God. I like to, you know, what do y'all think about God? Who is God? You know, isn't, isn't it amazing that, that we're going to heaven? You know, I, I get the occasional shut up. One time I was on the soccer field, and I got really excited. We were playing, and one of the kids messed up, and the coach said, God! And I said, hey, Mom, the coach, he knows God. He's a Christian. <laughs> she said, I don't, think he's a, I don't think that means he knows God. <laughs> I didn't understand all that back then. But I became very rebellious because, see, God made me. We're all part of the body, and I'm more like a function of the heart. I want to see, I want to see people living out the life that God's put for them. I don't want to see a bunch of imitators. And when, I was, when I'm around a lot of people that try to act like other people, you know, I just get confused. And see, God showed me how to enter into other systems and understand other systems. I went to college. I graduated summa cum laude. And I'm saying that, thank God, because, you know, I had really done a lot of drugs, and it was hard to concentrate. But thank God I studied scripture, and he started healing my mind back up. Well, I started understanding how things worked. You know, I started understanding if you can do this and this and this, this and this and this result happened. And my mind became like a machine. And tonight, I really feel like I'm supposed to give a word for the church, but it's a couple of dreams I had. And see, it's embarrassing because I was a good, now when I was a kid, I was a bad speaker. I would get real nervous and, you know, just shake and shake and do whatever. I mean, it was terrifying. I, it was hard for me. But as I got older, I became a really good speaker, and I enjoyed it. But I always had like a little certain formula I would go by, and that formula worked great. And see, you know, I, I love education. I love to see you know, people get, you know, learning how to do, like, formulas and stuff. To me, 
you know, it's interesting. To a point, after four years of college, you're ready to be out of there. You're like, okay, this is enough. But I really enjoyed it. And so for me now to break that and not do that, the same formulas and stuff, it's hard. I don't want to because I feel like it's like, man, someone's taking my clothes off. I'm just sitting up here and, and sharing, and it's crazy. But you look at the greatest speakers in the world, and, you know, these people, they were educated, but they really spoke from the heart. You know, you had you know, Martin Luther King, you know, who, who was very educated, and, you know, we studied him a lot. But it's like he knew how to appeal to the person's heart. There's something, an innate gift that he had to touch people. You had someone like Hitler that wasn't so educated, but he learned how to manipulate people's hearts. He didn't have a certain formula, but his formula was, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to analyze my audience, and I'm going to analyze their faces, and whatever they react to, I'm going to keep talking about that. And you have these, other, these speakers that, you know, good ones and bad ones, and maybe a little bit of education, but the real deal is, who is this person? This person knows who they are. You know, like Martin Luther King, this guy knows who he is. He knows he has a message that resonates. You know, his education wasn't able to save everybody. It, it was able to help bring his message, but it was really who he is. It's like he knew who he was. He knew who his message was. He knew that, you know, where was he in the Bible? Well, he could look through and see, you know, God has anointed me to set the captives free. God has anointed me for justice. He knew who he was in, in the spirit. Now, was he a perfect man? No. But that's something you couldn't just, you know, if Martin Luther King came up to me, in, I, I was in a time machine and I went back to the past and he said, you know, Josh, what's my will for my life? What's the will of God for my life? I'm not just going to take a scripture and say, lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed. See, that was not God's will for Martin Luther King. His will for Martin Luther King, go proclaim, captive, go proclaim freedom to the captives. Go proclaim equality. Go proclaim this. I would give him the verses that would talk about his life and each of us. Look, if we're going to find ourselves in the Scripture, in the Bible, we have to find stuff that excites us. You can't just grab a Scripture out of the Bible and say, this is me. No, God has made us each something. And we've got to find who that something and somebody is. And guess what? You're going to be rejected, too. You know, not by everybody, so don't get freaked out, but by a lot of people. You know, Christ came, and he was the cornerstone. Well, what happens when the Pharisees find out he's the cornerstone? No way, buddy. You're not the cornerstone in this church. And, you know, unfortunately, it's like when I went into this, uh, into this school and just was in a very religious environment, I had that feeling of, man, I'm not going to fit in. Anyway, how, what's wrong with me? You know, God, what's wrong with you? Why'd you make me like this? I don't fit in at all. <clears throat> Nobody accepts me. The only way I fit in is as a fighter, as a wrestler. But as far as this whole system, I don't fit in at all. What's wrong? And, you know, I didn't realize, you know, God made me above all this. God, God was trying to show me, you've got something to offer to these people. You know, you have a better way in your heart. See, we each have a gift, which is how we see the world. And I saw the world, and it looks so silly. It's like, why do people do these silly little prayers? Why do people sit here and, and act all religious and shake their hands and be nice to people? And then behind closed doors, they're totally other. They're otherwise. Well, most people would say, you know, that's how the world is. Just deal with it. You know, I can't just deal with it. I say, you know what? That's disgusting. I don't want to be around anything that's like that. And we're all hypocrites sometimes. Look, I, I smile and then talk about other people sometimes. And, and God will say, Josh, you know what you're doing? Yes, yes, I do, Lord. I know. But they deserve it. They, this person really deserved it. But I can't stand when I see people not being who God's created them to be. It, it drives me crazy. And, and it's like, you know, we don't have to live in a system like this. Look, this world, like King Solomon says, is insanity. Look at all the problems we have. We live in one of the greatest countries in the world, and yet we have so much problems with health care, with crime. It is not because we don't have the resources to deal with crime and health care and all this. It's because we don't have the right leaders. It's because we have a system that's insane, that has so many restraints on it, that nobody takes care of problems anymore. It's really sad. And so I had a couple of dreams, and I want to share this. I feel like it's for our church. <clears throat> my, my first dream was I was going into the military, and I don't know what I was doing there. I just, um, I just started dreaming, and me and this guy, this other dude is right next to me, 
and we're walking in, and in the, in the dream, he's my best friend. I don't recognize him, but I look down, and his face is tattooed on my chest, and my face is tattooed on his chest, and it's all symbolic. I don't have anyone's face on my chest, but we go in, and he said, and I say, hey, dude, this is the military. We're going to have to remove these tattoos. He said, never, no way. We're best buddies. You know, I'm keeping your face. I said, no, dude, we have, to, we have to part here, man. This is the military. You can't do this anymore. And so I, I have everything, like, super organized. I have these two book bags, and I walk in there, and I'm like, this is the military. I'm going to do everything by order. And I get up to the front of the line, and the guy says, um, where's your bags? And I look around, and they're gone. And I thought, oh, my gosh. And I'm just freaking out. And it turned out that, like, um, some table had fallen on over them, and I couldn't find them. And I said, sir, I am so sorry. Look, I take full responsibility. This is my fault. I'll go to the back of the line. And he says, no, sir, we're dealing with you right now. Okay, sir, what do I do? And he said, what are you good at? What can you offer the military? I said, I'm a communication major. I can, do, I can direct communications here. And so I walked away, and I realized, no, that's not what I'm supposed to do. And I walked back, and my answer was strange. And I said, look, I really want to be a sniper, but you know what? That's not what I'm supposed to do either. You know, the military, you, you kill people, but you also heal them. And I'm really good at talking to people. You know, if I had, like, a counseling position or a place where I can communicate with, with people, not as director, but, you know, just communicate with the people, that's what I need to do. That's, that's my part here. And he said, okay. And he looked at my clothes, and he said, you look like a slob. You know, you need to dress nicer. And I woke up, and I knew exactly what it meant. Um, that friend whose tattoo was on my chest, and my tattoo was on his chest, <clears throat> he was like a schoolmaster. He was, that was like my organization. And see, God showed me how to fit into the world system. He showed me how, how things work, you know, how processes work. But he was saying, no, Josh, you and the church are coming into a more serious phase. This is like a military-like phase. And a lot of these things that were comfortable to you, that you became real accustomed to, you have to let these things go now. So a lot of things in your life that God gave you, you're going to have to start to let it go. And this is something God did in my life. He sent me to school. He taught me how to, you know, work processes and, and understand how, how society works and a lot of things. But he's saying, look, you have to let this go right now. I'm simplifying things. And those bags, I couldn't find them anywhere. And he's saying, look, when you're part of the military, everything is really simple, cut and dry. And you're, you're entering into more warfare, but I'm going to make it simple for you. But for it to be simple, you have to let go of these bags. And you have to do what's easy for you. You have to do what I'm calling you to do, and that's it. And me being dressed like a slob, he's basically saying, you know, don't let stuff get on you. Don't let, you know, people you minister to and problems, don't take on all that stuff on you. You still have to have a good suit on. You have to not be stained by what's around you. You have to keep yourself you know, cleanse from, and, and from all the other anxiety. Don't take other people's problems on you. And, you know, that really hit me a lot. So I kept saying, okay, God, you know, I'm going to do that. And um, the other night I had a dream that was funny about my past and some good things. But at the end of the dream, I was, um, I was at a Brazilian Chahasco. We were making some beef. And my beef, I looked at it, and it was red. And I was saying, Daniel, I don't think I can eat this, man. I don't think I can eat this yet. It's not, it's not done. And this one pastor uh, from Brazil was in the dream. said, oh, I've got the uh, fire ready. Let's put it on the fire. And so I started roasting it. But God was saying, you know, when you look back in your past, you know, and when you're dealing with problems today, you know, make sure that, that you're not jumping to conclusions. You know, that's like eating raw meat. It's like you're jumping to conclusions. It's like you have to rest and you have to let the Lord cook it. You know, and like when I look at my past, I have to realize there was a lot of good stuff there, but I have to see it through the Lord's eyes. I can't just take a, something and, and, and consume it before it's ready. I can't just jump to conclusions and things. So God is moving us forward, and he does have a military anointing for this church. You know, not that we're going to grab machine guns and go out, but it's like a seriousness. We really mo are moving into more seriousness. And in the military anointing, I see more purpose. It's like he's going to be starting to show you guys Thing, you know, strategy, what to do with your life. And this is where we come to sonship. In Romans 8, <clears throat> you don't have to turn there if you don't want to, but at Romans 8, 14 through 23, I'm just going to paraphrase it. It talks about 
being led by the Spirit of God rather than being led by the spirit of bondage. And see, at Melchizedek Christian Church, we've been going through a process, going from the law, which is the schoolmaster, to the spirit, which is the spirit, which is Jesus Christ himself, his spirit. And coming into sonship, as it talks about in Romans, he's saying, if you suffer with me, you'll also be glorified with me. He's saying the whole earth... It groans for the creation, the creative process and, and the freedom of the children of God. And as the earth groans, it says also, we groan within ourselves. And so there's this part of us that's saying, man, I really want to be a son of God. And God's saying, yes, you can be a son of God. You're going to be freed from, from the decaying process of the earth. And see, we all have these fears. It's like one thing God's telling me about this military stuff this friend in my dream, that represents decay, and it has to be taken off of me. And so in my life, he's given me a lot of purpose. I have a lot of things I'm doing. Take, for example, my scripts, my study in German. Well, this friend of mine is like more like my mind, and for a long time it was good. It's like, okay, Josh, get up, you know, brush your tre- teeth, start studying German. Go to your script. Go do this. Well, you have this much time. Spend this many hours on this and this many hours on this. And everything was real logical. And it, lo- it worked for a long time. Well, today it's not working the same. And it's frustrating because he's saying, okay, I'm going to lead you. You know, I'm going to lead you during the day what to do when. Okay, you have a passion right now for your scripts. Well, you know, when I have that, I feel it. I work on it. I get it done faster and I get it done better. But... It's really tempting to go back to the old. But see, the old becomes like a torment. After a while, you know, you move higher and higher and higher, and God says, okay, you're hitting the ceiling. You know, now I'm going to take the ceiling off, and the ceiling is your old friend. It's your logic. It's, it's the way you're, you're accustomed to do stuff. It's your day-to-day life, your shell. And that shell keeps me awake at night because I'm going to sleep, and it's like, okay, I spent five minutes doing this, ten minutes doing this, I spent an hour doing this. I'm 36. Let's see, how long will I live? I don't know. Don's 77 almost. He's doing great, so I might have half my life left. Who knows? I might not. What if I die at 50? Will I have time to get this and this done? Uh, and I start thinking, you know, in terms not in an in, in hour or day. I start thinking in terms of year. And it's like, man, you know, am I, is my German going to be good enough when I go to Vienna? How good does my German need to be? Is my script going to be done? I try to get it done this year. And I'll just stay up, and, and it drives me. And see, it's like no longer is it peace. It's a, it's a driving, and I can't sleep. I stay awake, and, and it's horrible. But see, God does want me to get the script done. But there's another drive that I feel, and it's a grace that comes inside of me. And it's like I wake up, and I'll say, you know what, Josh? Go outside today. Spend some time praying. Spend some time in the garden. <clears throat> Spend some time watching TV. Spend some time on German. But he gives me a grace. It's like... It just, it bubbles up. It makes it easy to do. It's a joy. And these two drives fight each other. You know, for a long time, they were friends. For a long time, I could have both that real logical drive and I could have this spiritual drive. But you guys, our world is getting darker. And, you know, some people say, depending on who's elected, we're doomed. I can't tell you that's going to happen or not. But our world is getting darker. We know that. And... The darker it gets, the more our light is going to shine, and the more we're going to move in the Spirit. Well, we're all pretty smart people in here, I hope, but God has something a lot higher than our intellect. He wants us to be led by the Spirit every single day. And being led by the Spirit and being led by the practical aren't always going to go hand in hand. You don't just throw the practical away and say, you know, I'm going to be led by the Spirit and walk across the Cumberland River. You're probably going to die. Or at least smell really nasty. It's a disgusting river. But day by day, God is wanting to take you guys from the ordinary, mundane shell of life and put you into the spirit. Me and these guys have been studying every Tuesday about Elijah and Elisha. And every time there's a problem, Elisha does a miracle. Well, we don't have enough bread. Well, Elisha makes some kind of nut cakes and feeds everybody. Just like Christ, he multiplies it. Well, the axe head flew in the, flew in the water. Elisha takes a stick, throws it in the water, and the axe head comes back up. Well, we don't have any oil. We don't have any food. Well, there's a miracle all the time. Elisha raised a man from the dead. And see, 
God, what he's wanting to do in our lives, he's saying, you're comfortable at a level, but I'm taking you to a whole nother level. If you really want to move in that place of prophetic and being able to hear God's voice, you have to let go of the practical in your life. Now, again, don't let it go all in one day. You know, you'll know when he's moving you up. You're going to feel it inside of you. It's like a bubbling up. But when you feel it, don't go back to the old practical because he's saying, you know, Don, Luina, Morgan, I want, I want you guys, just you three guys, not anybody else, no, everybody. I want you guys to come up to a higher level. I want you to be led by my spirit every day. I want you guys to do miracles. I want you guys to prophesy. I want every place you go to be a divine appointment, to be in my grace. I want to teach you how to practically walk with me. That's what the practicality is with Christ, practically walking with him every day, not just walking in your mind. And to do that, a lot of this old stuff is going to become your enemy. You know, it says that the law is like our schoolmaster. Well, this practical law that we live by for year and year and year, eventually it's going to become your enemy. And so for me, when I'm going to bed, I have to say, okay, okay, I'm not listening to you tonight. I'm going to bed. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit here and doze off and count sheep. I'm not going to think about how much time I have to spend on this tomorrow or how bad my German is. Or, or this or that, or how much my plan to I'm just going to go to bed. I'm not going to sit here and think about this. And I have to fight it. It's really hard. But see, you know, God is a very, is a, is a very young child. He really did give me a gift. And, and I knew I was very aware of angelic. I was very aware of reality. I would look around at other Christians in life and I'd say, don't people realize how foolish they are? Don't people realize if we just all loved each other and... and, and and, and live the life we enjoyed, we'd be a lot happier. And, and people, but, you know, but look, you don't fit into the world. Look at the world system. Well, screw the world system. What does Solomon say? The whole world system lies in insanity. It's insane. It's crazy. Why would any of us want to live under the world system? But it's so tempting because it's like, yeah, but this is how everything works. Well, God's saying, yeah, it's good that you know how things work. It's good that, that you're not ignorant. Even Christ knew how the Roman system worked. He said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Give what's to God what's his. But God wants us to so come up out of that world system that, that we live in his system, we live in his provision, in his everything. And when you find who you are, when you find your call in Christ, when you find your story in Christ, look, he's going to provide for you, just like he did with all these people. Look at Joshua, look at Daniel and the lion's den, look at Gideon, look at Moses. See, God was with all those people, but they rejected the world system. They didn't reject who they were. A lot of times we reject who we are so we can fit in with Israel or fit in with whoever's around us. You know, look, it'd be very tempting for Joshua and Caleb to say, you're right, these giants are really big, man. Woof. Y'all are right. Okay, let's go have a drinking party and, and have a good time. No, they said, let's go kick these giants' butts. We can do it. We're, we, we got a big God. And, you know, the Israelites, oh, I don't know, these giants are pretty big. But these are the two guys that made it. And they weren't afraid to find their story. And that's why, you know, you have to go back and say, God, where is my story in the Bible? Where is my story with you? Because when you find your story and you walk your story out, look, you may have a really hard beginning, just like Joseph in prison or David, you know, fighting Goliath or sitting there with a the sheep. But you're going to have a great ending because when he anoints you, He's going to anoint you to be a king. He's going to anoint you to be a priest. And he's going to be with you. But you've been born from above. If you can find out who you really are and walk out that, look, he's going to put his angels around you. He's going to guard you himself. He's going to lead you where you're supposed to go. And you are going to find out where you're supposed to go. It's like when I was in high school. And, you know, the people that could be more realistic with themselves are the guys that got the girls. But the other guy said, well, if I can be like that guy, I can get a girl. It didn't work because the girl usually wanted the real thing. And, you know, a lot of times people say, man, if I can just do this and this, man, how many ministers imitate other ministers and try to be like this person or that person? It's like, you know, man, God made us so much individual. You know, if, if you guys really saw who you were in the spirit, man, you wouldn't have a problem with anything. You'd say, man, you know, I've been a king this whole time. I've been a queen. I've been a prince. And I thought I was an idiot because I didn't fit in over here or over there. And see, it's embarrassing because we don't look like anything the world has to offer. And so the world, it'll laugh at us. 
But those that really know us and, and love God, look, they're going to be drawn to us like white on rice. So we're all born with a special gift. David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Anybody that's been to Brazil with me, if you go to a foreign country like Brazil, you don't ask what is being put in front of you. You say, hey, take a piece of these. It's very good. And you taste it and you say, hey, that's great. Or you say, that's disgusting. But you have to taste it. You can't ask. You can't say, hey, what does this chicken heart taste like? Well, it tastes like chicken heart. <laughs> you know, chicken heart ended up being pretty good. Some people don't like it. I thought it was okay. I ate, I ate a bunch of it. But David says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You have to taste what God has for you. You can never sit there and think about, hey, this might be what it looks like. And sit there and ask God, what's it going to look like? What's it going to look like? No, you have to taste it. You have to say, God, let me taste what his life is. You know, when you read scripture, there will be certain things that will stick out to you. And that's because God's saying, hey, this is for your life. You're tasting what your life is about. You're tasting something that's better. And it says a young lion is lacking suffer hunger. So look, even people out there that are like a lion that go out there and try to get everything for themselves, and you know in a negative sense, they're not always going to be able to get it. But David says, he who seeks the Lord shall not be in want of any good thing. So you don't just go out and run after what's in your heart and seek your own life. Christ says if you seek your own life, you'll lose it. But if you find me, you'll find your life. And that's why it's so important to seek after God. He says, delight yourself in him, he'll give you the desire of your heart. Well, again, it's the desire of your heart. It's not anybody else's heart. But as you seek Christ, look, he is going to give you this life. And my message today is we all have a story. And some of us just, we don't think we do. We think, well, if my life was like this, if my life was like that, you know, here's my scripture. So, no, your story is personal to you. He has, a, he has a life for you. Each of you represents something. But look, if you're not doing your job and being who you are, you're just going to get run over because you're going to be fitting into the machine. And that's what the devil wants. He wants a bunch of cogs in his wheel. He wants a factory. He wants, he wants to see a bunch of religious people that are divided, that have no idea who they are. They take one or two scriptures and build their entire life out of it. Look, the devil has done a great job at confusing the body of Christ. And is he going to win? No. We know the end of this story is the body of Christ. We're going to beat him. But right now, you look out over all the world, over our country, you've got 6,000 denominations in the country, 35,000 in the world, according to the Pew Internet research. That's insane. And all these people really believe this stuff. And it's like, man, if just a handful of us really knew who we were, we could take on the world. I mean, that's the thing. There is a huge connection between knowing who you are and walking in God's will for you. Because God's not going to support something that you're not. God is going to support you as a son when you can find yourself as a son in him. When you can say, oh God, now I know who I am. Now I, really, I was so embarrassed about myself, but this whole time, you really love me, God. You really love me. Wow. And that's the son, that's the daughter that's going to overcome the world. So to close the night, I want to pray for you guys. Oh, there's one more thing I want to say. I almost left it out. A lot of us have looked for our lives ourselves, and we say, you know, man, my life stinks. I don't like what I'm growing. I don't like my surroundings. I said that when I grew up in this real religious surrounding. I said, you know what? Everyone around me is miserable. These Christians are all miserable. I'm going to do my own life. I know God's good. Sure, I believe in God. But I also don't see, I don't see God working in anybody's life. I see a bunch of sad people. I'm going to go have a good time. And see, that's who I am. God's made me as someone that wants to have a good time, that wants to see people walk in joy, that wants to walk in joy, that wants to explore, that wants to enjoy life. You know, God made us to enjoy life. You know, and that's part of my message. That's part of who I am. And well, I enjoyed it the wrong way, but it should be enjoying it with the Pharisees. At least I enjoyed it in the flesh and had a good time and got to learn what not to do you know, and didn't sit there and, you know, struggle the rest of my life. But, you know, I enjoyed the life the wrong way. Hey, Chris, how you doing? Hey, Lewis. And it was really sad because, I, you know, I chased after these things, and I said, you know what, why go after, why be miserable and sad like the rest of these Christians? I want to have a good time. And so I went out, and I did about everything you could and think of. You know, I didn't kill anybody. But I did about everything else. And I had a really good time. And I said, you know what? This is my life. I'm really happy. Thank you, God, for my life. Thank you, God, for, 
And you know what? I, I really was happy because I thought I've done something right. I'm truly happy. I am truly happy. Well, a couple, you know, years into it, I overdose, and that's not good. And I realized I've done something wrong. But for those of you like myself that try to find your own life and realize that you didn't make it, I've got a verse for you. <clears throat> Hosea. I'm going to read Hosea chapter um, 1, verse 2, and then a few verses in chapter 2. So this time during Israel, Israel was playing the harlot. And God says to Hosea, the prophet, in chapter 1, verse 2, When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take to yourself a wife of harlotry, a prostitute, and have children of harlotry, for the land commits flagrant harlotry, forsaking the Lord. So, you know, it's interesting because Paul says, you know, how should you be joined to a prostitute? How can the member of Christ be joined to a harlot? And you would think there's no way that God would say to a prophet, go marry a prostitute. Well, God said to a prophet, go marry a prostitute. Now, if any one of you told me, hey, God told me to uh, marry a prostitute, I'd say, you're probably not hearing God. And you probably aren't. This is very rare. This doesn't happen all the time in Scripture. But it's a very strange example where God tells a prophet to marry a prostitute. And what, what God's doing in this is saying, look, this is how Israel is with me. Man, we got some sick, we need to pray for some people back here. <laughs> this is how God, this is how Israel is with me. I still love them, even though they act like a prostitute. Hosea chapter 2, I'm going to start at verse 10 and um, skip around and go through 16. Hosea 2 verse 10. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. I will ruin her vines and her fig trees, which she said were her pay from her lovers. I will make them a thicket, and wild animals will devour them. So, see, we're, this is the uh, fig tree we're talking about. And God is basically saying, Israel, you've been a whore, you've been a prostitute. I'm going to expose you in front of everyone because I am so sick of you being my wife and cheating on me and, and doing all this. But then look what he says later. Hosea 2.14. Therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. Then I will give her back her vineyards and will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. There she will respond as in the days of her youth, as in the days she came up out of Egypt. In that day, declares the Lord, you will call me my husband. You will no longer call me my master. It's hard for a lot of us to come back to God and be intimate. See, God wants to be intimate with us, but a lot of times we're afraid because we said, man, I really blew it. Man, I blew my life with drugs. I blew my life with women. I blew my, my life in a gang. I blew my life, whatever. And, you know, to you, God would say, no, I still love you. Look, all this stuff you did in your life, all these sins, they're bad and I don't like them. You know, and I'm, I'm going to expose them and take them away from you. But God says, yet... Yeah, no matter what you've done in your life, no matter what kind of sin you've committed, no matter how crazy your heart has been and, and how many lovers you've had, I still want to be intimate with you. I still love you just as much as when you were innocent. And that's the word God has for us today. He really wants to be intimate with us. He wants us to have that life. If we've thrown our wife, life down the trash can, God can still restore it. Just like he says in Jonah, he makes up for the years the lo locusts have eaten. So you guys, I want you all to stand tonight and... Um, Y'all can come up to the front. I want to pray over you guys.